Okay, we're live. So this is a little bit different. This is uh, Simon Simon's New York Stories live on Restream. So if it works, it'll be in uh, Facebook and in YouTube simultaneously live. I want to thank everybody on YouTube that you got me up to 150 subscribers on my channel. And, you know, I know some people have like 11 million subscribers or something, but I'm not running a goddamn popularity contest over here. I'm very happy to have 150. So I want to thank all the people that did subscribe. The other thing I want to thank Corey Kilgannon, uh, the news reporter, because he, he did an article about me. I, I, I'm in the New York Times. I mean, sun, last Sunday's New York Times, it says Boardwalk Beach Bums Business. And it's just about me playing my upright bass or teaching surf lessons or whatever I do to get by, you know. And I'm playing my upright bass on the beach. And so that was a nice thing. Check it out in the New York Times. And the other thing that... I want to say is I had my uh, operation uh, Wednesday, last Wednesday, so almost a week ago, and they, they cut out this pretty gnarly thing. It was like rubbery scar tissue with fiber scar tissue and a, and a nerve in the middle. So they had to cut it out of my head, but I'm not in pain anymore. I was in pain. I remember one day, I was skipping around here on the New York stories. I was sitting in the back of the worm van. The worms were on tour. And we were going from Madison, Wisconsin to Minneapolis in a snowstorm. So we were doing like 20 miles an hour and skidding around. And, you know, like uh, we go over this big bridge and we look down into this. They have these things in Wisconsin that are called dells. And it's like you'll be going along through these flat cornfields and all of a sudden there'll be this gorge hundreds of feet deep and we go over this bridge and and at the bottom of this gorge is like a tractor trailer truck that went off the bridge like all fucked up and i was like whoa shit this is no joke but i remember all of a sudden i heard felt twinge in the back of my head like an electric shock and it was like this electric shock stabbing pain and it never left me from like I guess like November, November 1985 to now. So what's that? 36 years I was in constant pain and I finally couldn't take it no more. And I went to 21 doctor's appointments. I went to the, the useless clinic over here on 62nd Street. I call it the clinic shaped object. It's like a pretty useless place. Uh, because my doctor died from COVID-19 and my other doctor retired. And and the place just got chaotic, like nobody gave a shit. So I switched all my shit over to NYU, Langone. And all of a sudden, people started listening to me. And I went go to the doctor. And, you know, I tried to get this fixed years ago, 2000. I went to this doctor. And he was just one of these these pill pushing doctors that wants to get you all strung out on whatever kind of fucking shit. And I told him, look, I got this pain in the back of my head. I want to get this thing cut out. If if it, it feels like there's this button in the back of my head. And so he was like, Oh, that's nothing. Your problem is you're depressed. Why don't you take these pills? And and uh, then he was trying to get me to take Ritalin and all this stuff. So like I, uh, you know, so then I had a very dim view of doctors for a long time. I was like, they're just going to send me out for a million tests and try to give me pills. But I finally, I got to NYU and they actually treated the source of the problem. So I went in there, I rode my bike to the hospital. It was by Brooklyn Army Terminal. So I rode my bike there 15 miles. They cut me. I took the train home. It's like a pretty nasty scar. It's pretty gnarly, but it'll, it'll, you know, I'd rather have a scar uh, in my head than be in that kind of fucking pain. Like, like, holy shit, you know?
it's so much less pain. I can't tell you. And the next day I got up, I lifted weights and I, I rode my bike to Brooklyn again to teach. And I've been swimming today. I swam a mile and a half. I swam down to OV, the projects. From my house, I swam all the way past the Hamels down to OV. Like, that's like 33 blocks. So it's like over a mile and a half in the ocean. So it feels good, man. I had my jaw, well, my jaw got fucked up. Uh, they fixed my jaw, cleaned it out, and now they fixed this shit, cleaned it out. So, like, I'm ready to enjoy my life, you know? And uh, that's it. So that's that's for all the... Uh, look, Argirios Costaras. Hey, what's up, kid? Uh, so that's, so I had my operation and now I'm going to start, I'm going to, you know, I want to go practice my guitar, but I'll continue the stories. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to go back from this week. We're going to go back to April 1981. Okay. So I had the worms going for three or four months and I was doing that, playing all the all rockabilly stuff off the rockabilly records that I had that I learned songs from, and uh, I had only written two songs in my life to that point, maybe three. So we were just doing like you know good old rockabilly stuff, and and uh, I was play I played a gig with the Outsets, and I was out. Tom catting around, you know, just kind of Tom catting around, you know, being the way I was back then. And it, so I was up all night and to the next morning, and I decided I was going to go see my dad basically because I wanted a nice warm couch to crash on and to raid the refrigerator, being a bum that I was. So I go uptown and I saw my dad and like I had the key to his house, but he was there. He was, and uh, he didn't go into work that day. We'd, so I was like, hey dad, how are you? And he would seem really happy to see me. Uh, and we were talking and he said, you wanna go out to breakfast? And I said, Dad, I'm tired. I was out all night. You know, I was out all night and I did, I haven't slept yet. And I'd really like to just take a little nap. And then when I get up, we'll go out to lunch. And he looked at me kind of sad. And he goes, you may not have another chance. At the time, you know, now I realize what he was trying to tell me. Uh, but back then, you know, especially with his broken English. I didn't really understand it, you know. Uh, but then he looked at me real serious. And he says to me, he says, my son, you are in the best profession in the world to get women. But you must be like Andres Segovia. You must be like Django Reinhardt. You must practice five hours a day, like they did. I did not want you to be a musician because it is a very hard life. But now I see that it is your destiny. It is what your destiny to do, but you must practice every day uh, to be like Django Reinhardt. And do not listen to your mother, whom she is trying to turn you into a uh, homophobe. Insert a homophobic slur here. She's trying to turn you into a homophobic slur. And I said, okay, Dad, I'll see you when I got up. I laid down on the couch, and I was asleep for a while. But I was asleep, but I heard like a <laughs> noise like that, was, uh, like that like a noise, but I didn't think nothing about it. And the phone rang and it was an old friend, an old friend of mine that I knew a long time from Central Park days. And, uh, and 
they wanted to talk to my dad. They loved a friend of mine. They loved my dad. Well, all my friends loved him because he was such a fucking rascal. He was such a, like a mischievous, entertaining fucking rascal, and he would hold court, you know, with all my friends. So I go in to look. Hey, Dad, my friend wants to talk to you. He's in the phone, and my father is lying there with his face in a toilet. His face is in the fucking toilet. And he's all limp over the toilet, and there's, like, pills everywhere in the bathroom, in his room. There's pills, and there's all this stuff, like magazine. It's like this tornado at his house. But, you know, my father was a doctor, and he had all these medications and stuff. And in his house, they were just everywhere. Like, and I run over to the, I thought he just fell down. I go over, but his face was in the toilet bowl. And I tried to pick him up, and he was, my father was a big guy. He wasn't like me. He was like 5'9", five, 5'10", five, like 185 pounds, and kind of built like a bull. He wasn't like this little fucking mosquito motherfucker. So, like I am. So, I tried to pick him up, and he was dead. His face was like this green, blue, purple color. His hair was wet from the toilet. And he was cold when I touched him. It's like when you go to the fish market and you're buying fish and you pick it up. It was like he was dead. And I was like, holy shit. I didn't know what to do. And 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 uh, I didn't know what to do. I was like in shock, you know. Like I was like, holy shit, my father's dead. And I called 911. And the firemen came, the firemen and the, and, uh, the ambulance came after a while. You know, back in them days, it was like it took a lot longer for them to come than it does now. Uh, but they came and they were like, I'm sorry, there's nothing. The fireman said to me, there's nothing we could do for him. He's gone. He's, he's gone. I was like, no, I was like in shock. You know, my father's dead, you know, and my father was kind of a, uh, larger in life character, you know, because he could speak Spanish, English, Portuguese, Italian, the, the Sicilian dialect and the Roman dialect, and French fluently. He could also speak Creole, like the Haitian language. He could also speak Papiamento, which is what they speak in like Aruba, and Curacao, and I think Trinidad. He could also speak some Greek and some Latin. So, you know, he was also a doctor of medicine. And he also loved uh, the opera. And he loved the old school jazz, the hot jazz, like Django, Fats Waller, Louis Armstrong, Pee Wee Russell. He loved, you know, he loved all that stuff, like the old hot jazz, you know, Jack T. Garden. And then he loved opera. And then he loved uh, Jobim and Sergio Mendes. So that's the music I grew up with in my house, you know. So I was like, what the hell am I going to do? Then the cops came and my father's dead. I tried to clean up the pills and everything and all that shit, you know. Uh, uh, the cops kind of cop grabbed me by the shirt and pushed me into the wall. And he was kind of pushing me, and he was like, you didn't get along with your dad too good, huh? Maybe something happened. So the cops were trying to sweat it out of me that I that I killed my dad, which I didn't, you know? And uh, I was like, I was like, I said, the cop, fuck you. I loved my father. We got along great. You know, and my father was a very complex character. He wasn't always the nicest guy. He was a product of his generation, like the Archie Bunker generation, you know? So, you know, there's some, but some of these Archie Bunkers, around, even around here in Rockaway, they got a, a better heart than their exterior would suggest. So like, my father was like that old school kind of Archie Bunker, like, guy, but, you know, very macho because of his, his culture, but... He had this other side to him that, that I got to know better, you know, and, and I was just, I didn't even know what to do. Finally, everybody left. My mom came home and she just lost it. Really, at that point, 
my mom's mind, when she came home and found my father dead, my mom's mind kind of snapped and she was never the same after that. She started just screaming and howling. The weird thing is that my, my, my mom and my dad were very codependent with each other and they fought all the time. They didn't get along. But when my father died, my mom, like, went into this thing. She never came out. She just went down this other thing. And it's like, it's, it's almost like she started her downhill path when she came home from work and found him dead. So, like, they took him away. And it, I didn't know what to do. I was just sitting there and... I went into the other room and I had some weed. I just, I got high and I started practicing my guitar. I didn't know what else to do. When anything gets like really fucked up, I always just want to go off somewhere and practice my guitar. So anyway, that's the story about my father's death. So, uh, my brother took it real hard too, you know, and and uh, we, you know, then after that, after that, my mom wanted me to come home and stay with her for a while. She didn't want to be alone, so like, I kind of left like the studio ten. And uh, the opera story, it's in there. It's it's Don, it's back in there and uh, in, the, in one of the earlier stories. Yeah, that's another thing about my dad. I told you the story earlier, but he punched out this guy in the Metropolitan Opera House and we got thrown out. But I thought that was like one of the greatest things that anybody ever did. So he was a real character. So then... The Worms, we had Don, who's on the line right now, and then we had Mark Ettinger, and then Jono and me, and we started playing, so we we uh, were playing Studio 10, but then Studio 10 got raided by the city or something. You know, it was a squat, and I guess some developer wanted to, to, to take it, and, you know, some backroom deal, like, and so the, the Studio 10, they got, they got thrown out of there and uh, we were, I think we played like Great Gilded Sleeves, which was some kind of like, I don't know, some kind of clip joint up there near CB's and we were just playing around. But then John O comes, he goes, hey, I met this guy Tyrone. I was uptown. I met this guy Tyrone and he runs a couple of weed stores. He's got the reefer store on 81st Street. And, and back then there were now now pot's legal, but back then it was illegal, and you had to know where to get it, and you had to know somebody. And they had these reefer stores that would masquerade as like a candy store or a flower store, and you had to go in there, and you went into the back, and there was a, like a metal chute, and you put your money in the chute, and then a bag of weed would come back, and then you you know you fucked off out out of that place. And there was a bunch of them. There was one on 10th Street and Avenue B that later was like the Lakeside Lounge. And there was this one on 81st of Columbus. And there was other there was other reefer stores. You could also get reefer outside the Corso Ballroom on Thursday night when Tito Puente was playing. You could go up there and you could buy weed. So or you could if you or you'd have to know some like snobby hippie from Central Park that would make you listen to some terrible record that I hate like like you know sit through some kind of fucking hippie record for half an hour to get your weed. So that, that those were your options back then. So this was one of those weed stores. So he said, I know this guy Tyrone, he's got the weed store and everything, and he wants to manage us. So we met with Tyrone, and what Tyrone did is he had a van, and Andy Witten, Zephyr, painted Joey Miserable in the Worms, this great tag, with a worm with like a beret on and shade smoking a joint. You saved Tyrone's girl from getting raped and you were a cab driver before John O met Tyrone. Well, wow, that's it. That's a, I didn't realize that or I forgot. I, I might have forgotten that story. So, yeah, Tyrone was a guy that was always around like up on 81st. And that was like me and my dad's whole thing, you know. 
and near Marty Taub also and Johnny Sender. Uh, went by the name Johnny Schneider back then. And Marty Taub was up there. My dad was up there. Uh, Don lived up there too. So we got we got with Tyrone, and Tyrone helped us out. He went. Him and John went to the music store, and they bought like a couple of. And Music Man amp. Jono didn't have an amp, so now Jono had an amp. He had a Music Man amp, and then we let he let us use his van. And Andy Witten painted these great burners on the side. Joey Miserable and Worms, and then we had a couple of other pieces of gear. Like uh, I think we had like one of those those custom tuck and roll Norgahide PA systems that were like '60s or '70s thing. But we had some gear now. And, uh, and anyway, oh, we got more chats here. Yeah, we're gonna, well, we're gonna get to that part, man. We're gonna get to that part, Don. So, Tyrone helped us out. We also, uh, he paid for us to go do some demos, so. I knew this recording studio, Variety, on 42nd Street, because my mom, when I was a kid, my mom used to do a lot of things at, at Variety when she was producing children's records. And she would take me there, and I'd sit in the control room and watch all the musicians, and it was like, I want to be a studio musician. And to this day, that's what I love the most, is making records and being in the studio and mixing and producing and playing. And I love recording. I just always loved it, and I think I got that love of it from my mom. So anyway, so I was staying with my mom's house, which I kind of, you know, it was good for me because I could just be a fucking bum, right, and and trying to live off money from gigs or, like, whatever. So we we started, Jono was always really good at hustling and getting us gigs. So we would play, we were playing out in, like, the Hamptons and Long Island, and we played like upstate and we play, I know maybe Don could fill in, uh, going back to the variety. Yes. Sun Ra recorded there. So did Charles Mingus. So did a lot of jingle sessions. So now we're getting into the summer and we're playing all over the place. John o was just really good at getting us gigs. John o got us a gig at Max's, right? So, we actually fucking, we made the first Worms demos at Variety. And, uh, and, and then, uh, we went, we recorded there at Variety. We made four songs over there and he put it out on a 45. So we had this 45 out now. We used to go around and, and, uh, you know, try to sell it at gigs and everything. And we had the Worm fan. And, you know, we'd go hang out with Tyrone and, you know, he had the reefer store. So we would all work there and, you know, and then and we'd all work there. Sometimes we'd go and there was this one guy, Lee, right? He's this kind of fat guy, Lee. And then sometimes the store wouldn't be open. So he would get all the, the weed that he would pinch from the store and he would sit out front and sell it to these yuppies for double the price. So now a nickel bag was a dime bag and shit. And he would sit out front, he was scamming everybody, this guy Lee. Uh, and you know, we, so we used to, you had to go in the whole, the whole shtick of that place is you had to go in and buy a flower for $1 and then you could go in the back and buy weed. And it's obviously he's paying the cops off, right? So then we played out in Long Island and, and we were driving back from staying up all night playing Long Island. I remember that's the first time I ever heard the Start Me Up. That was like the last good record the Rolling Stones ever made, really. Uh, but that came on uh, on the record and that came on the radio. You know, we had like little AM radio. And then we played Max's. And that, that was great because I could say I played Max's. And Chuck came down and he says to me, he says, look, I just got this uh, saxophone. I got it at the pawn shop. And it was like, because he was a flute player and a drummer. He wasn't no sax player. I was like, well, that's great, man. You want to play with us? He was like, I, I never played it before. I said, find me a B flat. So he put the mouthpiece in in the reed and he found B flat. And then they said, this is what they did back in the 50s. Find a B flat note 
and just go honk, honk, honk over and over again and then go walk on the bar up and down just playing one note over and over again and you just could play with us and we'll call you up. So we started playing a jump blues number at B flat and Chuck goes out there and he and he decides he's gonna walk on the tables like right off the I don't know how to explain but Max is there was you had to dance in the back. It was all a fucking table joint like the bottom line or something, right? So he walks on the tables and the fucking the fucking table turns over and he falls into the ground, boom, and his saxophone breaks. And Ch he, Chuck melted down. He flipped out. He was screaming and hollering. He was making seagull noises like, ah, ah, ah. He was flipping out. And Tyrone, bless him, Tyrone was like, don't worry. The Tyrone was from Guyana. He was from Suriname. I can't really uh, duplicate his accent. Right, but he says to Chuck, Don't worry about it, bro. I'm gonna take it, I'll pay for you to fix the sack. So Tyrone paid for him to fix the sack. So you know, and uh and you know, Tyrone he Tyrone was a gangster, you know, he was involved in, in that life, you know. Uh, but he was really good to us. And I gotta say that like all early in the days of the, the worm's career. The, all the people that really helped us out were either selling drugs or they were gangsters, full-on gangsters. Those are the, the two personality types that really helped us back in the early days, you know. Um, and, oh, Mickey Amato. Oh, thank you. How are you? I love all these people coming on with the chats. This is I'm going to do this live from now on, whatever I do, the story. So... We played Max's, right, thanks to Peter Crowley, who booked us. He's not on tonight, but I, we're still friends to this day. And so we I still have that Max's poster on the wall right here. So a couple of days later, I'm at my house. I was hanging out with some friends of mine. I played my guitar. I fell asleep. My friends conked out on the floor in my mom's house, too. My mom was just like, I'm still this way. Like I, I love my kids and I love all my kids friends and I love it when I'm surrounded by all these younger people like my kids age and we're all just hanging out. I still love that. So it's like my mom loved it too. So she always encouraged for me to have my friends around, you know, so uh, we all kind of passed out the floor and it, and it was my brother. And, uh, and uh, my brother said, Tyrone's dead. They just shot Tyrone. And so now I want to tell you how that happened. Uh, it was, it, there was another woman. It wasn't Beverly. I think her name was Louise. Don, Don say Beverly's ex-husband was real mafia. But, okay, this is a fucked up story. But, okay, I was hanging out with Tyrone and this guy, Eddie, okay? and me and Tyrone had a bunch of different stores and we went over to this other store of his and we shot dope and Eddie Eddie had dope so we all like you know we shot dope to this day when I went to the hospital last week they couldn't get a hit in my fucking right arm they had to put the IV in my fucking left arm because these are all fucking tracks I still have them from the fucking 70s and 80s see that they they like you can't get no needle in those motherfucking things. They're like <laughs> fucking tracks. So we shot some dope. So we're sitting around, and I was gonna go see. I I was uh, and then so we're kind of scratching and nodding a little bit. I didn't shoot a whole lot of dope to where I was all like all over the place, but it was I did a taste. You know, I was like scratching, nodding out. So then Tyrone went to this bar. And I, I, I wasn't planning to stay long. I was going to split. I wanted to go play my guitar. I always like playing my guitar. I like playing my guitar now clean, but I always like to play my guitar when I was high, you know, so I was going to go off and do that. But we went to this bar, and there was this other lady in there, Louise. And this is where Tyrone fucked up big time. This is what got him killed. He goes, he introduced me. Hey, this is my ex-wife, Louise. And, you know, we shook hands and we're sitting at the bar with Tyrone. Was you want anything? I was like, no, thanks, because you can't drink and do hair on at the same time, unless you're Charlie Parker. 
it don't work. It's like downer and then downer. So I was going to split. But all of a sudden, him and Louise, they started getting into it. They started arguing. And Tyrone went out and he hit her. He hit her really hard. Knocked her down. And I split. And I was like, what am I getting involved with here? This guy just hit a woman. Like, you know, my father used to beat up my mom. So, like, I was like, what the fuck am I getting involved with over here? This is, like, a really bad sign. I am, uh, this is, like, some sketchy-ass shit. You know, you, it, you, you, you don't hit women. Well, Louise's ex-husband, who I don't know the name of or anything, but Louise's ex-husband was a maid guy. Okay, so they shot Tyrone. Yeah, that's right. Uh, no, just straight it out. I really, but I really appreciate. I'm so glad you're here in the chat, man, because you know, like we're telling the story together. You know, uh, so it was Louise. So she'd been married to this this maid guy, and then. She was married to Tyrone, and now they were divorced. So it was I had I didn't see Tyrone. I I did I didn't see Tyrone for a couple of days, and then that's when I found out he got killed. And he lived on the he lived across the street from the reefer store, like 82nd Street and Columbus Avenue. And he was com coming up the stairs, and they shot him in the balls and in the belly and left him to die like that it was really really fast it wasn't it was like two days later he was just dead and if i remember a bunch of us and our friends yeah it was beverly's apartment you're right louise's son lured him up he came up and they shot him in the balls and belly and just left him to bleed to death in in the, in the stairs and uh so uh th so tyrone is gone you know they they killed him real fast so a bunch of our friends i remember john i remember sarah globus Jono's friend a really nice person and i and me and for, we went to the cops, and this is like for me to go to the fucking cops is a big deal because like I think that's the last time I ever went to the cops for any reason, and you know I never trusted the cops and wanted to be around them for any fucking reason, and this really cemented my attitude about cops. All right, we go to the police precinct, and like how much fucking money did Tyrone give these fucking guys every month? to operate that reefer store, right? It's not like they didn't know. It was like, how much money was he giving them? And we all go in there and they keep us waiting. We go in and we talk to the lieutenant and the lieutenant literally said this to us. I got a lot better things to do than to worry about one more dead, the N word. I'm gonna repeat myself. This is the way things, like we live in a racist fucking country. We, we live in a country there's a lot of fucked up shit, but but, like, even nowadays, there's less of a chance they could get away with that because they'd be on some kind of video. Or be I got a lot better things to do than worry about one more dead, the N-word. And you guys are his friends. You guys are into some bad shit. You better get out here, out of here right now before I lock you all up, too. So we left. So... Uh, that was Tyrone's death, and he was our manager for, like, yeah, Peppermint Lounge, April 1st. Thanks, Don. Yeah, we played the Peppermint Lounge. I think there's still posters around somewhere. So we, it was, like, uh, April, May, June, July, August, September. He was our manager for six months, and then this shit went down, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, that was also kind of when things started really uh well we'll get we'll get into it but 
those those were some fucked up times like uh my father dying and to this day i don't know if my father took an overdose committed suicide or just dropped dead from a heart attack i'll never know i don't need to know uh and then the whole tyrone thing and then we wound up uh you know the bad brains also had rented the joey miserable in the worms van to go on tour i wasn't on that tour but john joseph was on that tour he wrote about it in his book that they rented joey miserable in the worms van right and uh and uh so it, we wound up giving the van and all the amps like it was a, a music man amp and a music man cabinet and like this little kind of fucked up pa head and a couple of little monitors we wound up in the van we just wound up giving them it, beverly started going out with alvin snake the drummer in blood clot and then the bad brains roadie and she started going out with Alvin Snake. So, like, we gave her back everything that Tyrone had given us just because, you know, we wanted to do something to help Beverly. I think we were probably helping out Alvin more than Beverly. But, yeah, Imro's trucking, right? Remember that? And uh, so that's the story of uh, 1981, my father's death and joey miserable in the worms and and gangster tyrone and the death of gangster tyrone i want to thank everybody who was here with the comments thanks don for you you couldn't have picked a better time to be on the comments and thanks for filling me and everybody and i'm doing these new york stories from now on live like this and then i'll save them to my youtube channel we're up to like uh, 150 subscribers so uh I'm going to go outside now and stop raining. I'm going to go outside and practice my guitar. I'm still a little tired from the operation and then all the swimming and surfing and everything. And a little tired, but I'm all right. I'm ready to enjoy my old age pain-free. So thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Bob Berger, for hooking this whole thing up. And uh, that's it. Over and out, another insta installation of New York stories. The next one will, will, will. Hi, Mickey Amato. We're gonna get to the Worms tours also when when I met you. Joe Flood, great to hear these stories, Simon. Thanks, man. Liz says hi too. So yeah, that's that's the uh, the Tyrone story. I always I, I still want to say thank you to Tyrone. You know, just like my dad, he did some really fucked up shit that I can't excuse for, that I not gonna I wouldn't do myself. But on the other hand, he really helped me out, man. You know, and uh, he helped the worms out. And uh, I have I you know wherever you are, Tyrone. Thanks, man. Be good, Simon. Great story, says Andres Villamil. Thanks, says John Haber. Joe Flood, everybody, thanks for watching. And and uh, Joe and everybody, and Andres, we got to do a memorial for Steve, for Steve Antonacos, homeboy Steve. Uh, we got to start thinking about it and schedule it. Oh, you did? Wow, yeah. So we did. We played the Lone Star. We played the Peppermint Lounge. Yeah, oh, don't worry. 1988, that was one That was one hell of a year, man. Oh, more messages. And then, yeah, we're going to... Everybody's here that remembers Steve Antonacos. We got to do a memorial for him. Uh... I want to do it in Manhattan because Steve lived in Manhattan and we all played in Manhattan in the scene in those days. So I want to do it in Manhattan, preferably a place with the back line. And I just want to have some pictures of him up and just have everybody play. You know what I mean? Everybody get out there and play. So uh, 
please contact me about that and we'll all try it. I, I want everybody to go to it. And Don says he's stuck in downtown LA traffic. Holy shit. Oh, we give vault. For that, I wouldn't trade places with you for a million dollars. Okay, guys, over and out. See you on the next one. Mwah.